Hello, everyone. This is Olivia. Um, I will uh, introduce uh, sentiment and sentiment classification in this video. And hopefully that you can review the video and prepare for questions and uh, applying the concepts using R uh, in, uh, for your assignment one. So um, the, uh, the agenda for this video primarily is to um, quickly identify some uh, examples of sentiment, the applications, benefits, uh, and some challenges of sentiment and uh, sentiment analysis. Although we won't get into uh, the challenges much because we will continue to talk about sentiment analysis in the next week or so. So we mainly will focus on the uh, focus on sentiment classification, uh, the text processing required for feature extraction, the feature representation of uh, textual information, and uh, and the process for doing sentiment classification. So some of the uh, topics uh, about sentiment analysis and other related text mining applications and areas, we uh, will come back to that uh, another in another video. So let's get started. Uh, sentiment, uh, this is uh, really motivated um, to find out um, what other thing because practitioners in real world business settings or different kind of decision making settings, uh, the information of this sort could be useful. For example, what patients think could be useful to physicians or to um, uh, other providers management uh, organizations and uh, what um, others think about a product, about a restaurant, about a service, or about a movie could also be useful to the um, artist, uh, to the owners, uh, the business owners, or other types of stakeholders. Sometimes could even include other consumers uh, just would like to know uh, what others think about a product when a consumer is making decision about uh, uh, making shopping decision. So because uh, consumers and all kinds of uh, users of internet have uh, published a lot of their uh, opinions or what they uh, think about products, services, um, and, uh, and art uh, pieces like movies or music. And uh, information now is widely available, information about what others think. So uh, in the forms of, for example, reviews of movies, products, and services, uh, blogs and that bloggers um, published, uh, tweets um, by, uh, in microblogging platforms like Twitter, uh, stop tweets uh, and Weibo, uh, some other global international uh, 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 microblogging platforms, uh, emails, text, and um, service requests, service inquiries, um, and also like consumer surveys that to find out how uh, satisfied consumers are and what are their comments about services or products. So there is abundant of information available and uh, to uh, sentiment analysis could potentially create value from uh, information about uh, what others think. So um, when uh, sentiment is being used uh, similar to a lot of other terminologies. So in various uh, literature including uh, dictionary uh, sentiment is uh, a kind uh, is can be defined as a kind of attitude, opinion, uh, refined feeling, uh, which we uh, often consider as emotion. Examples of this are um, like positive, uh, negative opinion, emotion, or attitude um, about stocks, um, bullish, bearish, and um, 
uh, and about other uh, subjects, uh, anger, more detailed uh, categorization of sentiment could include different psychological aspects of our um, emotion, uh, like anger, uh, surprise, sadness, disgust, fear, happiness, and so on. Um, so many of these are synonym, uh, synonyms of sentiment, and uh, but many others also uh, sometimes also uh, uh, mean sentiment like influence or impact. So um, what are some of the use cases of sentiments? Um, I definitely started out uh, getting into sentiment analysis and uh, text mining from also uh, pro uh, projects uh, and real world uh, questions. So coming about it from a very practical point of view, these are some of the use cases uh, I personally feel very important and literature uh, practitioners out there also have identified this as use cases or sentiments. Very importantly, businesses or uh, product managers really want to, uh, or customer uh, service manage, um, managers are uh, care about their reputation and the reputation of the companies in um, consumers or their customers' perception. So this can be um, using what the consumers think about the business and to identify the reputation of the business and then can respond to any uh, reputation issues, damages, or um, you know, uh, or even like praises or support. You also want to show appreciation. So um, by extracting sentiments, it could provide quantitative information that businesses can be used to produce. Uh, performance indicators, uh, analytics, and trends. So for example, if the sentiments uh, can be used to indicate customer satisfaction, so you can now produce um, perform uh, performance indicators based on customer satisfactions in the forms of sentiments from user comments or user blogs or um, consumers' reviews of your business or product. So, um, and uh, you know, more importantly, that besides knowing and uh, to, for decision support uh, based on uh, projection of what the future reputation, future uh, customer satisfaction level or future um, uh, sentiments about stocks can be helpful with, for example, um, uh, uh, resource allocation decisions by businesses or investment decisions by investors, uh, industrial investors or uh, individual in investors. So their purchase, uh, and similarly, even consumers could uh, think about uh, their uh, make, uh, uh, think about others' sentiments when they make uh, shopping decisions. For example, if there are some projections for like the sentiment for certain stocks could be going up or down, then whether that uh, would mean that uh, an investor should make the same uh, in, uh, investment decisions as the projected sentiments on the stock or not. So, um, and there are other decision makings or information could be useful. For example, if there are some companies want to uh, look for suppliers or want to identify competitors so that when uh, they approach their potential customers, they may avoid their competitors' customers, or they want to seek out their customers, uh, their competitors' customers. So competitor relationship is something that I personally am, uh, and my collaborator, research collaborators have paid attention to. So there are various uses too. Uh, so sorry, there is a typo here. 
and that uh, so social network uh, linkage and influence is also another potential decision that as a uh, social network users that whether I want to connect with someone else and whether uh, their certain based on their sentiments about uh, and their uh, tweets or retweets and their sentiments in their tweets or retweets could also be something to be considered. And in all kinds of settings, if the business models um, are dependent on advertisements, then advertisement recommendations or product recommendations based on the sentiments of um, like the ratings of movies or ratings of products and whether uh, some products should be recommended to some consumers or certain advertisement about certain product will be beneficial to uh, target certain consumer. This um, could start to leverage the potential uh, sentiment information. So we can look at lots of e-commerce potential, lots of financial uses of use cases of uh, sentiments, uh, uh, social network, and other online like healthcare uh, investor communities. Uh, more and more, in uh, uh, we're in an election year. Um, there's also a lot of reflection of the analysis of. Um, uh, uh, during uh, election time on the candidates like Obama and uh, um, uh, uh, Ron, uh, Mitt Romney and uh, previous candidates and as well as following the sentiments of tweets about the current can, uh, candidates. So the ranges and domains of, um, uh, of applying sentiments are growing very, very rapidly. So um, let's uh, learn about how to analyze uh, sentiment. And um, sentiment analysis includes various type of uh, uh, objectives. Uh, the most generic objective is mainly to extract sentiment from text um, because the, uh, the textual information may not necessarily be uh, be tagged or uh, have very clear sentiment indication. So by going through text to identify sentiment of in exhibited in that piece of text or unit of text is what sentiment analysis is about. Um, there's a common assumption that's uh, you know, uh, not something we will particularly do about, but as you start to apply sentiment analysis to a wide range of applications, you do need to think about whether the analysis uh, need to be extended or need to be modified. Um, because typically, that when we look at a unit of text, we assume this unit of text uh, is describing uh, one person's uh, opinion or one person how one person thinks about one particular uh, topic. And the topic can be the product, the uh, service, a service, or a, a movie, and so on. So, which means that uh, if a piece of uh, or a unit of text is describing several people's thoughts, my whole family, uh, from my children, my relatives, my neighbors, how they feel about. Uh, political situation or a particular candidate, then uh, uh, that kind of text need to be teased out to, uh, to reflect an individual sentiment. Otherwise, the sentiment extracted will be an aggregated sentiment of, uh, uh, of the thought, based on the thoughts from all the people uh, that um, uh, that, that were described in the piece of text. So, um, while getting down to something uh, more practical, uh, sentiment in, uh, in uh, textual analysis or in uh, data mining uh, will eventually take the form of numerical values or categorical uh, values. So numerical could be like integer uh, ratings, 
uh, on, on a poll or uh, of a, a movie review or product review, like five star ratings, uh, one to five, and uh, could be uh, po uh, uh, po uh, polar sentiments like true binary, positive, negative, true uh, opposite types could be uh, categorical or ordinal of a scale from uh, one end to another end, either in factor forms, like very positive to very negative, or it can also be like uh, negative uh, two, negative one, positive one, positive, uh, sorry, positive two, positive one, for uh, posi um, uh, positive sentiments and negative one and negative two for negative sentiments. So um, uh, this, uh, if the decision making can benefit from this type of representation, then uh, textual analysis have a way of uh, extracting informa sentiment information in this uh, val uh, uh, data types. And so coming out of uh, data mining, now, uh, we have uh, learned that uh, there are supervised approach to determine or to classify a piece of text into a uh, sentiment category, such as positive or negative. And or it can be a regression analysis that um, uh, predict or estimate the numerical sentiment values like 5 or 10 or 1 or um, 3 or uh, even 3.5. So um, f to estimate uh, or to classify the supervised approach, assume that uh, you will, you have some text uh, no, of which the sentiment categories or sentiment num numerical sentiment values are uh, known, are available, so that you can use this we call sentiment labels to uh, do training and do, do testing uh, of a model uh, to classify sentiment. Then this model can be used to classify other text that, uh, uh, that does not have actual uh, sentiment information. So that will be a way to do sentiment analysis in the, uh, using supervised sentiment classification or uh, sentiment prediction uh, uh, methods. Uh, others, which we won't get into today, um, will, can be unsupervised sentiment uh, uh, scoring approach where instead of uh, using previously known labels, sometimes text don't have sentiment labels and uh, to derive sentiment there could be some rule-based um, uh, approach to either classify or uh, some uh, simple uh, uh, aggregation approaches from uh, sentiment numerical values that could possibly inferred from uh, the individual uh, from smaller uh, from different parts of a unit of text which we will talk about um, uh, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks of the class so so now uh, the purpose of doing supervised or unsupervised sentiment uh, analysis using machine learning approaches uh, mainly will be to uh, help uh, analyze uh, sentiments for uh, textual content that does not really have all or uh, any uh, sentiment la labels. This particularly will be true when uh, in, you look into uh, content that may uh, 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 be added to uh, internet on the 
uh, on the internet, like product reviews, blogs, or emails sent to your uh, company's customer support, uh, and or uh, you find some historical content online or in printed form, but being digitized, but the historical content did not have uh, sentiment labels. So uh, how you find ways to get models that can uh, or rules, sentiment score, uh, scoring rules or classification rules to be applied to this um, uh, would be the purpose of sentiment analysis. So um, the focus of today's class and the majority of the, um, of the course will be on sentiment classification because that is a foundation and uh, of um, to demonstrate the concepts and procedures that can be applicable to sen uh, other types of sentiment analysis, such as sentiment prediction using regression analysis. It also uh, in, uh, encompass some of the text processing steps that could be useful for, for example, unsupervised uh, sentiment scoring and so on. So uh, we will uh, introduce the concepts and ask you to go through, apply some of the basic methods and approaches to do sentiment classification in your first exercise. So um, sentiment classification is essentially a combination of textual analysis and uh, data mining, or we should say text processing and data mining because classification is essentially a type of data mining uh, task. Uh, that's your classification task. And text processing is the part that start to extract uh, information that can, um, information and data structures that will be necessary uh, for performing a data, uh, uh, for performing a classification task. So if you recall that in classification, you will need uh, a target variable. And uh, as we briefly talk about for sentiment classification, our target variable will still be sentiment uh, variable, but it is uh, uh, sentiment factors like positive or negative or uh, categorical sentiments uh, like uh, uh, very positive, very, neg uh, very negative, somewhat positive, or somewhat negative uh, type of categories. And uh, we'll talk more about the uh, uh, data structures, but uh, first, uh, the, uh, the main concept here is that it is a classification task, and the target variable is primarily sentiment categories. Um, this is um, be, this has become popular mostly since uh, early 2000s and when researchers and practitioners start to get more and more interested in analyzing news and textual content. Um, uh, in the 90s, uh, there were um, actually a lot of interest in analyzing uh, financial news, like realtor news, and uh, some emails, like Enron emails. And um, as part of that, that some of the analysis start to become related to uh, sentiments and then, the, um, and then sentiment, uh, frankly, is actually even more relevant to other types of content that is generated by users. So um, the uh, original text analysis problem is called text categorization and it is simply also using uh, very supervised or unsupervised techniques to extract or identify the category to which a uh, unit of text uh, usually in the past is uh, an email, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a digitized uh, paper in medical area, and uh, text characterization can identify which category this text document belongs to. For example, if a web, web page is about data mining, or it is about programming, or if a web page is about a product, or it is um, about um, uh, 
uh, software uh, or about uh, restaurant or services and so on. So like I mentioned, this has been applied to a lot of uh, uh, large-scale um, content that are generated uh, fairly frequently. For example, um, news is uh, one, uh, emails and web pages. So um, to get to sentiment classification, let's look at the process. Uh, some of the uh, part of the process is good for us to know, but it's not necessarily uh, we will start out with or focus on. So, for example, it is very important when you apply sentiment classification that you think about the problem definition, that um, based on the problem you're trying to solve, for example, it is about customer uh, sentiment extraction, and uh, then where do I find that kind of um, uh, content uh, that may contain consumer sentiment or consumer satisfaction. And if you are a restaurant, would it be from reviews? And if the reviews are housed in your own uh, restaurant's homepage, uh, web, uh, website, or it is in Yelp, and you need to identify how, um, what channel you could possibly uh, extract it. But in the problem definition stage for sentiment classification is actually very similar to the problem definition for the uh, uh, classification in data mining task is first determine what is your target variable and what kind of value representation or what kind of data type will be um, uh, sufficient for your decision making or your decision support um, of course further down the road since you're doing classification you're doing supervised learning you must also determine that do you have the sentiment labels um, about um, customer satisfactions of your um, coffee shop, of your uh, bakery shop um, that you can use to train a sentiment classification model uh, using previously known labels uh, uh, of sentiments based on the text. Uh, that um, the sentiments attached to. And um, to decide on your classification, your um, each target uh, variable value is attached to a piece of text. Uh, text unit is pretty lucid, and uh, you could have, a, a, you know, a, a, all the reviews from one customer, all the reviews from customer in one region, all the reviews in one month, or a single piece of product reviews or, or uh, restaurant reviews. Or within even one review, there's some follow-up comment, um, or within a review, there could be uh, some short title, and uh, there are separate paragraphs, uh, they could be uh, even decomposed to sentence level. So these are the different uh, a hierarchy of uh, texture units that uh, sometimes could be, could be considered as the unit of analysis for sentiment classification. The most important thing is no matter what unit of your analysis is going to be like sentence, a paragraph, a title, or a whole review, a whole blog, whole uh, piece of email, the sentiment label for that unit of analysis should reflect the sentiment for that unit, like for the sentiment for the uh, sentence, for the review, for the email, or only for the title. Okay, so these labels and unit of analysis need to be compatible need to be meaningful. So that's the important thing for data scientists to think about during the problem definition stage. Once is, uh, the problem is meaningful, is well-defined, well thought out, uh, ready to uh, gather data. Uh, if data is not readily available, then you can conduct web mining. And uh, for example, for political blogs, political tweets, and that already have some previously uh, labeled sentiments, then you could start uh, uh, gathering information. And this is 
uh, not part of our uh, the, uh, te techniques or methods that we focus on, but as part of our exercise, if we have, it, have time and opportunity, we definitely can utilize uh, some R interface or other type of API interface to uh, uh, think about collecting uh, interesting uh, online uh, content related to sentiment classification. Okay, um, the, uh, uh, the next few steps are the most important part uh, for us to learn in the class. Uh, one, uh, the first is to structure the unstructured content, um, which uh, is to create the data structure that is necessary for classification. Because for classification, besides that you have the target sentiment uh, variable and, uh, and also known uh, values of, uh, from historical data, you also need to have the improved variables or the predictors that traditionally are like, for example, gender or age, uh, and uh, to predict medical expenses or the, um, uh, to uh, make diagnosis of a patient or to classify whether a patient will uh, switch or churn to another uh, carrier or not. So these are um, traditionally, the data structure of input uh, uh, variables or predictors are well structured. Either they are uh, uh, factors, they are numerical, or they are character. They are uh, structured in the uh, uh, data frame or matrix form with columns representing those variables and the values stored in those columns for uh, the customers or the objects that, uh, uh, that are described using different roles in that uh, data structure. But in, with text, we don't have, we, we have the roles because we can, with each unit of textual uh, content, like a review or like the title of a review or like a whole, uh, um, paper or a whole digital doc, uh, textual, digitized uh, textual document, you have this individual uh, documents or individual units that you can separate them into roles. But if you look into each role of that contains um, uh, with text, it's just a whole string of text. Okay? You cannot see uh, the columns out of that. And uh, classifiers such as decision trees, not Bayesian support vector, cannot use that kind of whole complete string of text just as by itself to do the classification. And, um, and it's not going to be, um, uh, uh, it won't necessarily be able to uh, generate the, uh, uh, the classification correctly. And so, and it's also hard to generalize that. Therefore, um, the, uh, the purpose of structure, the unstructured content is to create that um, data structure, and that will go through two steps. One step is to identify the column headings. Okay, what should be the variables? We're not looking at age or gender or that type of uh, individual demographic uh, variables, but we rather, rather we're looking at variables related to the text and being very simple-minded and not necessarily very domain-specific, um, we can use uh, the individual words in, a textual, uh, in a unit of text to uh, become the columns. So in fact, the columns will actually be a collection of the possible, the words that appear in uh, uh, the whole uh, collection of uh, uh, textual documents or textual content. And um, so that we can use those variables to represent not only one document, but also other, um, uh, many others, including in the 
documents that may come up in the future. So clearly, that will be a lot of uh, the words, and we uh, uh, won't get into dimension reduction or feature reduction too much. But that's something uh, we will do it in a very simplistic way somehow um, uh, in the first exercise. But um, that is going to be a challenge that immediately comes up. Um, but let me come back to talk about uh, structured and unstructured content, which is the second part. Besides that, you have the column headings for the data structure for a classification task, such as decision tree. And the columns are about the words that you can extract from uh, textual documents. Um, how do you, uh, what values you assign to the cells uh, where columns, uh, a word, for example, and a document that as the row, uh, that's a row intersects, and which means that how do you represent this? Um, you know, this word in this document to a classifier so that the classifier can use that represented, uh, representation or that um, uh, you know, quantitative information to make, um, to complete the classification task, such as like in decision tree. So um, in uh, structured to unstructured content, we will only focus on numerical. Uh, uh, representation of uh, words and uh, because feature represent feature here are focusing on words or a collection of words so which is for simplicity we call them uh, word features and the representation will be always numerical so we call them uh, 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 the feature or word collection of words or a single word called term and the numerical representation of those uh, uh, a word or a collection of words is called term weight. So, and we'll talk about term weight uh, and the meaning and the reason uh, a little bit more. Okay, um, and we can come back to this um, as we go through textual processing, dimension reduction, and um, feature extraction sometimes go hand in hand as there are a few uh, techniques that you, you use uh, for reducing, uh, for extracting feature already help uh, reduce uh, the number of features. So dimension reduction essentially is trying to reduce the number of word features or uh, word terms. And uh, for example, re removing words, common words like the, a, uh, and uh, propositions and so on, um, stop words removal. That's one way of both, um, a, a one way of doing feature extraction. And um, there are others um, which we will talk about. For example, if there are some terms that don't appear in um, a lot of the documents, uh, uh, which means not a lot of the roles, and we can consider remove that. There are other techniques that we won't get to in this assignment, uh, but uh, during this course that we would like to um, uh, go over so that you have opportunity to apply it because they will also be very useful in, uh, for real world applications. So after you have produced the data structure for sentiment uh, for a classification text out of um, structure content and you have somewhat manageable number of features um, or um, if it's a lot you can still give it a try then you essentially uh, are ready to go back to uh, perform uh, go back to what you learn in data mining to perform uh, classification model building and of course we cannot forget testing um, if once you have a um, classification model that has acceptable performance and that can be deployed, then there's other steps to go through to make to uh, produce um, a product uh, industry level or uh, uh, production uh, 
implementation for real world uh, deployment, and then the consideration of how to keep it, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, up to date is uh, some other. Uh, there needs to be also um, continuing process, a continuing process for that. Okay. So. Um, uh, before we can go back to performing classification model uh, building and testing, uh, we should now uh, understand this uh, structured to unstructured content a little bit better. So uh, when we talk about, uh, that's about uh, texture feature extraction and texture feature representation. And uh, so we can now start to take a look at what are some of the common um, processing of text that could help uh, produce uh, textual features uh, that can be included in a um, uh, data structure for classification. And what are the uh, different represent, uh, texture represent, uh, texture feature representation, which earlier on we already talked about term weights. Okay, so um, the features that we want to extract, oftentimes at the end we call them bag of words. I use that a lot. Uh, word vector, word space, um, sometimes just combination of words are uh, the output of feature extraction. Okay. And uh, term weights, as I mentioned, are numerical, and we will just keep it uh, quantitative numerical um, to use numerical values to represent um, the meaning or the, uh, the use uh, to, to, make, to make use of the textual features in uh, building a classification model and testing a classification model. Okay, um, so uh, at the end, um, we can extract any feature, but the goal will be the features are useful because both uh, the performance can be good when we use them for classification. Secondly, they can be meaningful. And thirdly, that um, the reason we don't want you know, uh, a very, very large number of these features is could be both the performance could be difficult and uh, it's hard to explain that many or get some meanings out of all a large number of features. But when you test, build, test, and actually run, it could take a while. And uh, uh, in this class, we'll talk about um, We'll try different approaches. Uh, the most common one is the linguistic one, especially uh, um, there are um, part of the supervised and unsupervised approaches will still rely on linguistic approaches to do uh, text processing. And um, so um, in, in terms of objective in this class, initially our focus will be first uh, to produce uh, reasonable classification performance uh, because uh, getting meaning at the world level will be difficult. And we'll see whether later on we can use uh, some feature reduction techniques that could both help with um, uh, uh, to benefit uh, uh, development and runtime requirement and to benefit classification performance. But more importantly, they could potentially provide some more meaning. But initially, in your first assignment, we're going to be very, um, the focus will be on create a structure, let's evaluate the performance and see whether um, there are certain uh, method or a certain set of features could uh, give uh, better performance. Okay, so um, the linguistic approach primarily focus on um, these uh, three types of processing. Um, we will start off with mostly lexical and uh, syntactic uh, processing. Um, we will hope to get to a, uh, at least 
uh, name, uh, possibly uh, on, uh, only name entity extraction, um, which can cover a few uh, meanings, uh, semantic meanings of nouns, um, which the noun can, nouns can mean people's names, could mean or pronouns, could mean uh, company names, could mean cities or states. Uh, that could be useful when uh, re, uh, Yelp reviews are about restaurants in certain locations or about certain services or about some service providers like physicians or uh, names. And, or in movies, it could be uh, the uh, uh, director or um, other artists in the uh, movies. Um, the simple lexical and synthetic processing primary focus on this is first uh, the, the continuous stream of text uh, needs to be parsed into uh, individualized uh, parts we call tokens or terms or actually natural language processing uh, uh, scientists call uh, tokens. And uh, we will start out with just only individual words. So one word per, to per token, uh, one word per term. Um, in this co course, we will uh, use the next assignment and next uh, tutorial to uh, look into the use of uh, engrams, we call multiple word terms, and two or three or four or five. And uh, other uh, synth uh, synthetic processing uh, could, uh, will focus on uh, reducing words to some basic forms so that the different forms of the same word could uh, will be regarded as a, uh, the same word uh, without uh, mis uh, uh, with, uh, no, uh, without uh, uh, distinguishing them into separate words and therefore the classifier uh, may not leverage the the fact that they actually uh, are uh, meant the same thing. So uh, stemming, uh, reducing words to the first part of the words, common uh, words like movie, movies, uh, and uh, to first um, uh, part of the uh, words like MOV. And lemmatization uh, uh, will reduce to the basic forms such as uh, 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 is, are, uh, was, uh, reduced to be, and uh, or uh, all uh, words in upper and lower cases all change to lower case. This way then uh, different forms of the words can, uh, uh, as long as they have the same meaning, we hope to use this to help uh, identify the same meanings as opposed to um, represent them as uh, different words. And uh, other proce uh, text processing that I use partly for also for um, dimension reduction um, could be uh, to remove numerical numbers in some applications that may not be meaningful in, but not necessarily always the case. Uh, some applications may want to keep uh, the numbers. Uh, so these are just uh, only uh, possible uh, choices. Uh, removing punctuation marks, and sometimes people will like to because a lot of comma, commas, uh, periods, and uh, apostrophes, um, but sometimes punctuation marks like um, exclamation marks or question marks uh, sometimes could mean something, so it could also be used for uh, special characters, such as uh, if the text document is meant to be English, but there's some mix of foreign words, uh, or special characters uh, that not meaningful to be included. Uh, we mentioned earlier on um, the uh, 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 and stop words type. Uh, some um, uh, classifiers uh, or sentiment may uh, feel long words could may not be necessary or very short words um, may not be. Uh, necessary and that could also be a way 
and other will be specific to a domain such as movies or films are mentioned often they, that those may not be necessary could be removed and um, other synthetic uh, processing will identify um, the uh, use of a language uh, of uh, a, a term in uh, a sentence such as is uh, uh, the subjects, the objects, uh, verbs, uh, some adjectives, and so on and so forth. There um, actually quite a lot of um, the different variety, and this could uh, also be useful and meaningful to sentiment analysis. It's something that we will also like to get to in future assignment. Um, so not to, uh, not something we will um, learn this this time this class. Uh, and um, so this is just a, now a recap uh, to remind that uh, to, un to structure the unstructured uh, content using linguistic approach, essentially we're um, using lexical, synthetic, and semantic processing methods. Uh, we're primarily focusing on lexical and synthetic for the first assignment and uh, in future assignment maybe uh, 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 in week three, uh, we hope to get to some name entity recognition. Um, and we already mentioned a few, uh, mentioned this uh, as the feature extraction processings, and this actually are uh, some of the commands that you can find in different uh, environments. Uh, in R, you can find this in Python or uh, in C. Uh, plus C sharp, uh, C, C plus plus C sharp. You can find those um, typical feature sets uh, uh, on the previous slides. Also, uh, I we use they may be um, they typically are used interchangeably, uh, like bag of words or word vector or combination of words that will go into the data structure for uh, classification or supervised learning, and. This is um, some of the techniques we mentioned earlier on can be already used for feature reduction. But again, keep on the back of your mind that to learn some techniques related to uh, dimension reduction is also part of uh, um, uh, 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 part of the knowledge and uh, practices to to gain uh, in text mining. Okay, so. Uh, we can, uh, as you go through, we can start to think about, uh, as, as we start to apply, uh, try to think about this. What are the pro pros and cons of linguistic approach? Uh, I think immediately you could jump, uh, that would jump out, could be um, whether um, these features are meaningful. It could, be, uh, pre could have predictive power, but it could be difficult to explain. Okay, now I want to talk about the second part of the data structure for building and evaluating classification models uh, for sentiment classification. So the first part were the features, which are the columns or the column headings. Now uh, the roles were already given in your um, input or your um, uh, data set that is made available for um, doing training and testing. So now is in the cells of uh, 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 in the uh, data frame or matrix uh, for a row and a column, how do we represent, uh, how do we um, derive the numerical representations called uh, turn weights. So there's a, f a few common ones, and in this class, uh, we probably will use mostly more uh, three of them that are much uh, that are easily available in R. And but for various reasons, that you could consider additionals even beyond this. Um, let me start out with uh, the. Uh, this actually will be the first example. The third term weight, uh, sorry, the second one. <laughs> Uh, is called term frequency or term occurrence, meaning term counts. Essentially, it, it counts how uh, for a term. So we'll always reference the term as uh, t, and um, 
and if it's in column J or the J's word or J's term that's being extracted into the data structure, now we're looking at how to uh, give a numerical value for this term in a row, in a document, say RI. So rows I, columns J. So um, we'll count this word J, uh, T, uh, TJ. So for example, movie or film. How many times this word appear in a document? For example, a re review, uh, like the first review, the second review, um, either of the same film or of different films. Depends on how you group your uh, uh, reviews. So if it appear two times, term frequency will be two. Uh, three times uh, will be uh, three. Only one time will be one. And uh, that word is not in this document ri, then it will be zero. So going from here, we can easily come back to the binary, binary term weight. Um, if the term is not in term tj is not in document ri, then it is uh, zero. Otherwise, no matter it appear one time, two times, three times, or more, it's always one. And we, uh, some of the students have seen an example in the SNA binary um, uh, example. Uh, and some of this, this example were in the SNA, SNA uh, social network, I guess, analysis or SNS uh, data set. And it's, um, that original value were term frequency. So um, normalized term frequency is sometimes a review could be very short or a review could be very long. Um, only one sentence or many sentences or only one word or many words or only uh, 50 characters or 20, uh, 140 characters or um, 250 or uh, 5,000 characters. Depends on the type of application. And a term that appear uh, five times in a short document versus a term appear five times in a long document could mean differently uh, in terms of uh, its uh, predictive, uh, its impact or its influence on the sentiment of that unit. So this is normalized or uh, by, uh, we can normalize term frequency by dividing the, uh, the original term frequency tj by uh, the uh, some measure of the, uh, the document length, either in terms of characters or in terms of number of words or in terms of number of sentences some, somehow. And this is also called term uh, density. Some other uh, environment, for example, previously when we did text mining in RapidMiner uh, two years ago, um, this is also one of the very commonly used um, term weight. Here in R, I haven't seen it very much. So, um, and the last one is the most complicated one. I probably will go. Uh, I'll quickly talk about this. Uh, uh, what these abbreviations mean, and then we'll use uh, an example uh, in the next few slides to talk about that. So, term frequency TF is what uh, uh, TF uh, indicates or represents or stands for term frequency. So that's exactly the same as this part. It's the count of term TJ appear, uh, appearances in document RI. Okay, IDF, before we introduce that, uh, before we introduce inverse document frequency, we'll first introduce DF, document frequency. And that basically is a steer, document frequency is still a measure of the term TJ. Um, but it is not a measure of TJ with respect to a document R, R, R. I only is a measure for the whole corpora, whole collection of uh, documents. It measures that how many documents in the collection of documents contains this term no matter how many times the term appears in each document. So if your COPRA have 10 documents, five, 
documents contain this uh, term, say movie, and the other five uh, documents don't, then uh, the document frequency is just basically five. And uh, it can be normalized, but currently uh, that's normalized here. So inverse document frequency. So the meaning of uh, DF essentially is that um, uh, whether the term is mentioned by documents very, very frequently. So if you divide up DF by N, if say N, N uh, is the number of documents in your data set, and so if you don't do an inverse division, but you do a regular division, df divided by m, that means the percent of the data set that contains this term. Percent meaning in terms of number of documents out of the, uh, compared to the total number of um, documents. So in the previous example, 5 out of 10, that means 50%. 5 out of 10 documents contain the term movie. That's fifty uh, percent, and uh, so you no, know, it can be somewhat uh, frequent. Uh, the term movie, and uh, so for when you reverse inverse this ratio, and uh, the so when you have the regular division df divided by n. Uh, the lower means that the term is more rare uh, across the document. So when you inverse it, this, this value n divided by df, the higher the value is, the, uh, then the more rare the term dj is. So, uh, so think about 80, uh, 8 documents out of 10, uh, and that means uh, the term uh, for example, another word, film, uh, appear 8 out of 10 reviews. And 80%, that's higher, that's very high, that's higher than 50%. When you inverse it, uh, 80%, uh, uh, 1 divided, uh, which will be 10 divided by 8, 1.25, is lower than 10 divided by 5, which is 2. And so lower means is a more common term. So this is kind of indicate that how rare, how unique a term is. The higher value, it, uh, then the more rare the term TGA is. So IDF actually should be for, uh, for uh, the term J, and DF should be for the term J, and so on. Um, and because this range can be pretty high, so uh, IDF tip, uh, it, um, uh, used the log transformation to narrow the range uh, of uh, this uh, ratio. And uh, so IDF can be used as a representation itself, but it will be the same for all the documents, just like DF, for any term. And uh, but to use, uh, so this is like an index of how uh, rare a term is, and the more rare, the larger this value is. So when you multiply, pi, multiply term frequency by this uh, indicator of term uniqueness, or indicator of uniqueness of a term, the same term, then this, t this total value will become higher for unique terms, given that the same TF compared to, uh, of another term that is less rare. So if film and uh, movie somehow in the same document RI, they all got mentioned two times. But films been mentioned uh, more frequently than movie in the rest in the whole data set, then TF IDF of uh, movie will become higher than the TF IDF of film because movie is slightly more rare than, um, than uh, film in that data set. So let's look at example, it's uh, more clear. So uh, we look at six words, don't need to know which words they are. It can be film, can be movie, and so on, good, bad, and so on. 
just only look at five documents. Uh, I put in document length and just for uh, one of the uh, weight type. Um, so typically, this is um, this is very commonly seen that the term frequency, a term has been mentioned twice, uh, three times. Not very often that's repeatedly mentioned over and over, um, but also quite often that they are not mentioned. And because some words are mentioned in all, uh, but some words only mentioned in these two, and um, but um, this this word is only mentioned in this two, uh, this three, and this only in this two. And so it's different combination of words are mentioned in this. So we take uh, in the collection of words that be mentioned in these words to be the features. And the weights are ter term occurrences or the count of appearances of a term in a document. So, uh, so we'll go through this quickly because that's not something we uh, plan to practice in our assignments very much. Um, but you could definitely consider it for other um, uh, applications that you're interested in. And uh, so we talk about normalized term frequency or is at your term uh, density. The numerators here are the term frequency from previous example. And the denominators are just basically uh, document lengths, such as how many words. So, um, and for the same uh, row, of course, uh, document have the same length. But compared to different documents, the uh, same appearance of ones and the density change based on how long. Like this is a longer document, and this is a uh, these two are shorter, then the density is lower than uh, higher density, as uh, higher density than lower density. So um, this is just another example of uh, term density. Now let's focus on uh, get to DF and IDF. To get to DF and IDF, actually we um, can it's easier to start to look at the, uh, the other weight type, uh, called binary weight. So previously, any term appear no matter how many times, now all converted to uh, the value of 1. Uh, those, that, uh, those documents that don't contain this term um, still maintain the, val uh, the weights, uh, the zero weight. And so these are binary weights and zero and one. Weights and uh, you can easily total up how uh, how uh, this uh, uh, ones and zeros to find out how many documents contain this term. So uh, the total of this is five. The total of this is two, and three and four, so on. So these are the DF document frequency, the number of documents that contains a term. And remember, IDF is uh, since the data set has five documents, okay, so uh, is uh, five will be in the numerator over here. And uh, the denominator is DF. Okay, so this is a rare, more rare term, the, this two uh, most rare. So the denominator have the small uh, are the smallest for these two, so the total ra the ratio will be the highest 2.5 2.5. The log will still be the uh, biggest. So rare terms will cross uh, doc uh, the data set will have the highest uh, IDF values. Then uh, when we multiply TF by IDF. So this is the IDF values, and uh, these are the uh, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, uh, and so on. And I think I changed the example uh, that the original values uh, uh, multiply by, I think this should be, uh, oh, this were originally 1, but once being multiplied by the IDF of uh, 0, because this is log of 1, which is 0, and IDF 0 just basically wipe out, uh, just change the product to uh, 0 for all of them. 
But here, uh, based on the values, uh, this will be zeros, but this will be three uh, original term frequency. And, uh, and it's been, uh, the importance of this term for this uh, document, uh, for this document, sorry, R3, should be, should increase um, even further than three because of this uh, idea of, uh, is the highest of uh, uh, compared to all other terms. So here is the rest of the example. Okay, so meaning of weights, uh, I think what stands out most are, um, you know, binary just means they're there or not. Sometimes that's probably enough. Uh, if, uh, if you feel that some review mentioned good many times versus only one time, if it make a difference, then the frequency will be important. But if good is mentioned, uh, if uh, the word is also mentioned too frequently throughout the rest of, uh, throughout the entire data set, and you want lower that, then TF-IDF is uh, also a good choice. And so based on what you think, uh, you should try different ways because empirically, it still all depends on not just the weight for a particular word, like good, or movie, or film, but also it's the whole collection of features that are being used, and how the classification method can utilize those features to generate um, the model. So empirically, um, uh, even, though, even when you're using white box like a decision tree, it can still be somewhat of hard to interpret, and hard to anticipate, and hard, hard to uh, uh, you know, hard to identify that which features could be uh, uh, just, just based on the weights. Yeah. So, okay, so um, that's the, uh, about the weights that I want to cover. The rest I want to talk about the process of uh, generating back of words and generating weights and uh, representing them and in most of the environment. Uh, the data structure that contains uh, weight, term weights for bag of words uh, for a collection of documents or collection or, co uh, or uh, 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 the COPA um, will, be, will be called document term metrics. So um, I uh, want to first introduce some parameters about them as we start to go through. Uh, the process and should keep those parameters in mind, such as the number of words and number of documents, and uh, and uh, um, the names of the sets or the collections of them, such as uh, train set and test set. Typically, in for classification task here, uh, because the data structure is document term metrics will be a little bit more specific to uh, use the abbreviation DTM, like trend DTM, test DTM, and so on. Okay, so this is uh, uh, where uh, document term metrics is abbreviated, and keep in mind that this is in R, in, uh, in R and a lot of the data mining uh, and text mining environment. This will be the data structure that will be used to uh, train or test either a classification model or a regression model uh, or, uh, or, or a predictive model. Here, we we'll focus on classification model. So because it is supervised learning, we must have a train data structure and a test data structure. Uh, because otherwise, it would not be a mean, meaningful uh, supervised learning to uh, the ev uh, performance will not be uh, cannot be generalized uh, generalizable. So this uh, called train DTM and test DTM. And again, we just came out of uh, term uh, discussing in the examples of term weights. So remember, inside DTMs, the values are term weights uh, for. And for your assignment one, since we're using term frequencies, um, we'll just just uh, just assume that the weights are term frequencies here. Let's 
sorry about it. OK, um, so here I introduce uh, a couple of parameters, assumptions. I just assume in the train set, we have n1 document. In the train test set, we have n2 documents. If you want to do even splitting, it, they can be exactly the same. And, um, and for simplicity, we just consider one test set. Of course, depends on your testing method. You always, uh, you know, you will be required to do two test sets, and uh, in the future, there could be cross validation or other types of uh, time based splitting and other number of testing sets. But just for this, just to go through this process, uh, understand uh, the process of creating this and applying text um, processing um, on the original raw uh, text. Um, just assume one test set is perfectly fine. Okay, now we introduced uh, the bag of words, the parameter related to bag of words. Uh, let's just assume in words after you have, after certain text processing, uh, the number of words in the bag of words will be represented by the uh, parameter or the variable uh, n. Okay. And um, so this is after text processing and possibly uh, some sparse term removal. Okay. And I also want to, um, you to keep in mind that the number of words uh, in the feature set to go into DTM that I care about will only be the words that are determined or selected from the train data set or from the train raw data after text processing and so on. And we'll explain that a little bit more. So here M is the bag of words that was selected from the train set. And uh, so as a result, now we start to put uh, these parameters together uh, in train uh, term, uh, uh, document term metrics. There are N1 documents, so N1 rows, and M columns if they were derived from train, so that makes sense. But uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that in the test uh, DTM document term frequency metrics, a uh, document term metrics, um, the number of columns will must be must be the same as this number of columns as the train, and the features are identical between the two. So the column headings, what the columns are about, are. Uh, are about the same set of words. Okay, the words decided from the train data will be the words that will be used to uh, generate and calculate weights for test uh, document term metrics. Okay, so even so, for uh, train DTM, remember besides the rows and the columns. Uh, the actual values are term frequency. Of course, the frequency are counting uh, each uh, the, uh, the word in a column, uh, how many times it appears in a row. So that's our term frequency. Okay, so that's still calculated based on the document you have in the train data. For the text uh, document term frequency, uh, the term metrics, the term frequency there, of course, you'll still be calculated from the test set, uh, test data set for those N2 documents. So for in a, in a row from, uh, for a document from the test data set, but um, we will count a word from, learn from, uh, identified by train data. But even though that's identified by train data, we will take, uh, take that word into this test data set and count how many times that word appears in a test document. And that will give you the term frequency for the term DTM. OK, so the whole point is that these two must have the same M, and the M is decided by train. And 
Now the question I want you to think about, and I hope to explain in an example, is why should we have the same aim? And should, why should we derive that from this? And then later on, then we will start to think about in order to assure that this is the case. Then how should we in R when we implement um, text processing and data splitting and uh, uh, creation of this? Um, uh, data structures, train DTM, test DTM, how should we create them? Okay. So uh, one example here is uh, 10 movie reviews and um, short ones, uh, I made them up. And uh, labels are indicated here and also by the color, positive and negative. Okay, let me qu quickly move here is now uh, I'm ready. We're ready to. We can. Uh, we can see the term frequency uh, for uh, all the possible words that, uh, or the important words we decide to keep uh, here for this ten reviews. So I think there are uh, eight words. Uh, either this is not or no, and the rest are happy and so on. And this plot can be actually lowercase too. So you can see uh, in review one, uh, these words are not there. Uh, like appear two times, no other words. Like, like. And we didn't care about movie, didn't care about uh, uh, subjects, and we didn't care about other stop words. And we decided also, at this point, we just didn't get to uh, this. I recommend. So that's if these are the words okay, uh, that will go into the, uh, uh, the columns for uh, document term metrics. Okay. So now I have uh, used this column to indicate whether this document is used or review, used for train or for test, or train or test, train or test, and so on. Test is bolded. Okay. And colors are still positive or negative. So these are positive and these are negative. And um, we could qu quickly, and these are frequencies. So we got two times and one time and zero. We could qu quickly determine also document frequency. Uh, although we're not using inverse document frequency, but these are also there. But the point about uh, that I want to make in this example is this. If you have time, you can quickly take a look at uh, some examples here. So um, happy is, what, uh, is a word that never appear in a training data set. No documents can contain it, only in the testing data set. But if the training data set includes this one, the only reason is because this word was selected by the testing set. And um, so here, testing says here and here, and all the training will be zero. So this word will go in as a feature with zeros and to train a, uh, a model to try to classify uh, the test set later. And this could be useful, but may not be uh, useful because the usefulness of this in terms of term frequency were actually lifted by the test set. Without test set, just in training data, this word probably would not have been selected. It may have been removed because 0, 1, 1, or 1, if we want to only have fewer, if we want to further reduce the features. That's the same for plot, okay? But uh, test set only lift the uh, importance of plot by one document, this one. And, all, um, and this one has lifted the importance of the word other um, by two more. So in test set, in train set, this uh, unbolded ones are the reviews that contain this word in the train set. And, but there are four in the test set, bold, uh, bolded four ones that contain the word R. Uh, other. 
if two is not high enough, uh, then this would not have been in the train set. So, um, so besides the worry that the importance of some words would increase because you peek into, you have a leak, the test data term frequency, term frequency of the terms in the test data got leak into your uh, into during the stage when you decide the bag of work. And, and, and as a result, some of the features that are important to test sets got selected. And that could be a problem when you try to generalize the uh, uh, sentiment classification model that are trained using these features. Because in the future, when you apply this process to a trained data set, that data set would not have the test data set available. For example, you're trying to use um, uh, this month's Yelp reviews to build a sentiment classifier to classify uh, sentiments next uh, uh, of reviews next month. And the words and the uh, features uh, will be different there you will have no way of knowing them anyway. So as part of your practice, you, you should assume that the test data set is something that representing future data, and you should not peek into the future to grab words uh, to be used by, uh, for building a model today. I hope that makes sense. So um, therefore, uh, I would uh, ask you to consider uh, the uh, sentiment classification process, uh, the data preparation, the training and testing data preparation very, very carefully, and how you apply test processing commands like um, tokenization, like uh, stemming, like uh, uh, you know, change uh, words to lowercase, and the, all those processing, apply them to the uh, data uh, carefully. Okay. This is an option one that uh, you could use for assignment one, but uh, it has limited application and in that it can only be used in the case when like in assignment one, um, we're assuming we don't know the timestamps. So when we have a collection of sentiment uh, labeled data, we just randomly split them. And, uh, uh, rather, I actually would like you to consider option two more because this is absolutely necessary. This process is important. It's the way that you would do, assuming that your split need to be time-based. And secondly, even if it's not time-based, this option two still works. So let me describe this. And uh, when you have time, you can think about option one. So this is the raw data, contains a collection of reviews, maybe also other, uh, and also the labels, because we need to uh, do supervised learning, so we need to know sentiments, positive or negative. And uh, so right off the back, uh, you can do random split or time-based split. Time-based split could be based on dates or times or some sort of IDs that are chronologically uh, created after that then you can uh, perform two steps. One is to do your text processing of stemming, remove stop words, and so on. And in, uh, in tutorial one, um, we introduce like six and that you can consider and you can look for more, you can choose fewer in your own application, but just for assignment, we ask you to use all of them. And this text processing can be in embedded in the process of creating document term metrics. That will be also the way that um, we, uh, you know, that, that's, that's uh, the sample code uh, we show essentially combine these two into one. And um, so you will do this, uh, apply text processing and create document term uh, metrics uh, using training corpus, 
and do the same thing using test testing corpus separately. This two, so it's kind of no, because uh, you want to split them right from the beginning. After that, then you can your uh, inside document term metrics. You have one is your bag of words are there t1, t2, t3. Secondly, your weights are there, and the basic uh, term frequency will be the default. So that's why also we use term frequency in, in your first assignment. So then this, this essentially completes your uh, input variables for your train data set. Uh, I didn't show here, but um, we also need that target variable, like positive or negative, to uh, be included in your uh, train data set. Now, in this example, uh, in the document term metrics for word, must have T1, T2, T3 because the this bag of word will be passed on to this to make sure that only the term frequencies of these terms will be calculated uh, using this testing corpus. Okay, so then now you have, and then this will also be combined combined with the original labels here. So with the train, with the test, the same back of word features and the labels, now you're ready to build the model, train the model, and test the model. So I hope that makes sense. And um, this is uh, where uh, you should take this process and uh, review the tutorial uh, code and tutorial video about how to do um, how to do uh, text uh, split a whole corpus and apply text processing generate uh, extract uh, identify back of words and generate document term metrics and do the same for testing and then start to apply to uh, uh, build model and compare different method so uh, lots of things will affect the classification performance uh, the features uh, the method, so therefore we uh, show you a few methods and uh, you have learned a lot of methods from um, your data, intro to data mining class and you could, uh, besides assignment one, you should also take some opportunity to try that. So I hope this is helpful. Thank you. See you in class.